welcome. And we'll talk about the rest of your credits throughout this interview. Sure. Yeah. So one thing that we are asking women um, uh -huh. is tell us a little bit about your passion. When did you discover your passion? How did you discover your passion for film? I was a very uh, imaginative child. Mm -hmm. So I, my nickname when I was little was Janet Planet because okay. I was sort of half in fantasy, half in reality. So I was always in story. And um, so that led to uh, interest in the arts, all of the arts actually, and the performing arts. And I was that kid who went to the theater summer camp and, you know, mm -hmm. was in musicals. Sure. <laughs> and um, I went to, th to uh, undergraduate college and I did study theater thinking, I, I, although I was interested in acting, I was always interested in creating story. Right through performance arts. So I was really interested in making plays and writing, directing, acting, and I did that. I went to Wesleyan uh, in Connecticut where they foster a lot of student-initiated activity. Right. Um, the, the, the real action on campus is the stuff that the students are doing with each other as opposed to the faculty-driven. Uh, like This is where Lin-Manuel Miranda, he created um, his plays um, and his musicals came out of that. I mean, yes. we were different years, but that's the kind of environment. Yes. So, um, Knowing that I wanted to continue to make theater, I then applied to graduate school and I landed in the dramatic writing program at NYU, mm -hmm. a graduate program. And when I arrived at NYU, I discovered that the program was tilted as much towards film and film writing as theater and playwriting, being that it's NYU and it has one of the most lauded uh, long-term and robust film programs in the country. I started to go, huh. That's interesting. I'd never really thought that much about film. And within the years that I was here as a grad student, I became more um, interested in and awakened to the possibility of film and what you could do with the camera. And one thing led to another. And while I was a grad student, I ended up working at New Line Cinema. To put a little money in my pocket, I was reading scripts and doing what we call coverage in the industry, where you look at intellectual property such as books, screenplays, newspaper magazines, et cetera, and consider if they're um, appropriate to be turned into motion pictures. Anyway, so doing that freelance part-time, they hired me full-time, and I, for the next 10 years, grew as the company grew. And it went from being a scrappy independent that was doing higher to lower. We were releasing the early John Waters movies as well as, you know, French art cinema, right. to then releasing a feature that they produced called Nightmare on Elm Street. Mm. And so that changed everything. That changed their history. And I was really in the right place at the right time. And so as the company grew and they needed more um, help and staff to develop and oversee projects, I was really just smack in the middle of it. In the cinematic arts, well, in all of the arts, but certainly cinematic arts, technology form and content are so interlinked. Mm -hmm. And certainly the growth of the industry has everything to do with the, the change in the technology. Mm -hmm. So when you go from, for example, huge equipment, huge 35 millimeter cameras and equipments and lights that have to be set up in a studio to then in World War II developing a camera that can be taken onto the battlefield and document war and after that you get new wave, French new wave, Italian um, cinema realism, because there's suddenly a camera that you can move around mm -hmm. and you can leave the studio and go on location. Mm -hmm. So you start to see how the aesthetics are changing with the technology. Right. So I was in independent film at a moment where another huge change happened in technology, mm -hmm. which was the advent of video, mm -hmm. right? So once you can start to distribute films mm -hmm. in video versus in a movie theater proper, there's a whole new market. And so during the 80s, the 90s, when I was at grad school and then this baby executive in the world, there was suddenly this whole new revenue stream when people were buying video libraries. Mm -hmm. And we used to joke that you could sell a dentist's home movie on a VHS right. because everybody was just so hungry to acquire libraries. And so suddenly there was this flow of revenue and what are you gonna do with it? So a lot more movies started to get made and people started to roll the dice on emerging films and filmmakers. So I was really part of that wave that created opportunity for the emergence of the independent 
a cinema movement in America. It was like the second wave. The we think of the first wave of the golden age of American filmmaking in the 1970s. Right. We have the first newly minted filmmakers coming out of film schools like Coppola and um, Scorsese out of NYU, by the way. Right. Um, and uh, out of USC, you get Spielberg and um, all those guys. And I'm going to emphasize guys. Right. Right. And they come out and they start really working with film as the auteur, right, the pen, the author using the camera, and that's a really interesting wave. Then in the 80s, again with the advent of all this new technology, you can start to globalize quickly and easily film, and then you get the advent of the blockbuster. So what's happening is as the studio films start getting bigger and more global, it's leaving an opportunity, a kind of a niche, for the smaller personal ensemble stories that are character driven to emerge, like that audience isn't being fed at the same by the studios at the same time that suddenly there's all this revenue mm -hmm. for independent films and filmmakers mm -hmm. at the same time that Robert Redford decides that he's very interested in supporting voices and visions outside of the Hollywood system and he starts this little thing called the Sundance Institute mm -hmm. that starts to create opportunity for films and filmmakers and people with different kinds of stories to tell to get noticed at the time that I'm a baby executive. Wonderful. So there's this confluence. Right. At the time that I'm thinking, you know, the off-Broadway theater is, feels kind of stagnant, mm -hmm. and the off Hollywood, we used to call it off-Hollywood films, seem really exciting. And then there's this guy called Jim Jarmusch and Spike Lee, who also come out of NYU, and they're doing really exciting films. Mm -hmm. And I'm there looking for films and filmmakers. Now, in terms of my personal story, I had been wanting to write plays and direct plays, and I was doing that as a graduate student, but my interest starts to shift. So at the same time that I'm a baby executive at New Line Cinema, going to the first Sundance Institute film festivals and, you know, seeing the movies of, you know, Jarmusch and Spike Lee and, and thinking, do they work for our company and acquiring them and being really, in, and New York City is an epicenter of this kind of really interesting uh, new movement versus LA that still is very much the Hollywood system. Mm -hmm. While all this is going on, I'm also still getting some of my plays you know, noticed, like I did a, there was a reading at Playwrights Horizons, which is a well-known theater here, and I'm kind of thinking like, what am I doing? What am I doing? What do I want to do? And I'm getting more responsibility at New Line, and I'm able to actually produce some of the films of these emerging voices. And I remember it was, I was getting on an airplane, it was 1991, and I was about to go to Sundance with a film that I had helped to produce at New Line. At the same time that a play of mine had just had a reading at Playwrights Horizons, and I looked myself in the mirror and said, Janet, you have to decide. Are you going to step forward and tell your stories, or are you going to support other people telling their stories? Mm. I get on an airplane, I go to the Sundance <laughs> Film Festival. I go to, <laughs> I go to a party. And I meet David O. Russell. Mm. Life changes. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, my life changed. Right. And I ended up marrying him, um, producing his first film, being very actively involved in his emergence of his first three features, mm -hmm. having a child. Now, I also want to contextualize that this is a time when there wasn't a whole lot of interest in films that were being told by women. Uh, there was some interest in films being told by people of color, some interest because there was an identifiable market niche for mm. um, urban teenage movies, which, by the way, I was helping to pioneer right. when I was at New Line. So when I was at New Line, as all of this was happening to, over this decade of this wave of interesting new films and filmmaking, right. and I was in the right place at the right time and very supported by people who were who thought outside of the box, because who else was going to give somebody like me a chance to do things? You know, it was a very entrepreneurial kind of, you know, we're going to set the table, go. Right. Uh, the people who ran New Line were very uh, laissez-faire in that way. Mm -hmm. They would identify, believe in you, and say, go, do, do, go. Mm. And if you brought it to the table and it worked, they were very happy. So it was a really interesting time that a lot of us were learning on the job and developing skills. Mike DeLuca was my, he started as my intern. Um, he's gone on to, you know, run movie studios and produce wonderful films like Social Network. And um, I forget all of Mike's credits. There's so many of them. It's, he's enormously talented. Um, Toby Emmerich, who's now the president 
of New Line Cinema also started as on my staff. So there were a lot of us who were coming up during that time, tumbling around with each other with a lot of opportunity. And again, there was this flow of money that was coming from video, and then videos became DVD. And you got to think back, right? right? Go put yourself in a time capsule. Right. The average. Per, and people were purchasing libraries. They weren't just oh, yes, renting they were. them. They, they were, were purchasing proud of it. Proud yes. of it. That's, right. That's right. And so you think that the average cost of a DVD or a, a video right. was you know, $15 to $30. What is the average cost to stream a movie online? Not much to nothing. Yes. $3? Yeah. So you have to have 10 times as many people watching any given film mm. to equal the one person who would buy a DVD. Mm. So... I'm jumping ahead now, but then you sort of, so you have this huge expansion of revenue sure. and an expansion of opportunity and easy access to the movie. So you're cultivating audiences who are, can easily see things. They don't just have to live in the urban centers to go to the handful of independent cinemas to know what an independent film is. Right. And that grows and grows and grows. Then streaming comes in. And even though there are more people seeing these movies than ever, and there's this whole industry of independent cinema coming up and film festivals start springing up everywhere. There's a whole you know, cottage industry around independent film and filmmakers, but the revenue stream is weirdly shrinking. Mm. More people are seeing it, but that's not equaling more money. Right. Right? So there's a kind of a funny shift going on. Right. Now, I want to circle back to the environment for women. Mm -hmm. In the world that I knew, in the years that I was working in independent cinema, there were hard partying boys and uh, grounded, capable women who kept things going. Hmm. Yeah, and it was not a healthy yeah. situation. And it certainly wasn't a situation where, yes, you could be taken seriously in a support role. Uh, role. Right. And during the years that I was an executive at New Line, and it was my job to identify emerging talent and films and filmmakers, I certainly tried to advance female films and stories. Right. I brought Nicole Holliff Center and her first film, uh, Walking and Talking to the Table, pushed really hard for New Line to make it. Didn't happen. And Nicole Holliff Center has gone on to have a beautiful career. Mm. Um, I think if she had been born 20 years later, her career would be much bigger. She'd be much better known. Mm -hmm. I mean, frankly, Greta Gerwig is stepping into her shoes. Mm. Nicole Holliff Center was making the films that Greta Gerwig is now going to make. Mm and make with Academy Award nominations. Nicole's films are right. wonderfully well respected, but they're small and it's a different right. world to receive them. Right. So there were interesting women who were doing work, but we weren't being received. Culture, thank God, is changing. Yes. And not a moment too soon. So the Me Too move it's not surprising to me that the Me Too movement came out of a Hollywood situation. Mm. Because storytellers, carry the genetic code of culture. Like, stories are the, the DNA cell of culture. And stories are made by a certain kind of entertainment system. I call it the vast Hollywood international conglomerate entertainment system, right? You know, like there's the uh, military industrial complex, there's the Hollywood industrial entertainment complex. Mm -hmm. um, and independent film had always been in contrast to that. And still is. It's still kind of shifting and moving around. Um, but even back then, even if women did get access to the means of production by dint of their own efforts and very much outside the system with the most limited resources available, there wasn't a whole um, world of reception to support and believe in it. And it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? So if the people who are, con who are marketing and distributing stories. Mm -hmm. Do not believe there's an audience for a certain kind of story. That audience will not be cultivated, right. identified, or reached. Right. And so what we've seen over the last 30 to 40 years, and there's been much written about this, is the frustration of that every once in a while there'll be a film by four and about women telling our stories that has a big impact. Everybody gets all excited, look at this, who knew? Right. There's a market for films by four and who about knew? women, who knew? And then they promptly forget about it. Mm -hmm. It goes away and then 10 years later there's another one. It's like, who knew? It's like, well, excuse me, we knew. Yes, <laughs> yes. And we still know. So what is um, exciting and makes me feel very optimistic is that there is enough momentum to keep this going to feel that it's not another one of these bubbles that will burst. 
So yeah. this is, they say it's the, the year of the woman, it's the mm -hmm. era of the woman. Yes. If, as we rise up and say enough, mm -hmm. we're going to take our space, mm -hmm. we're going to step forward and take the place that we properly mm -hmm. occupy and deserve in every strata of society. Of course, the stories uh, that we want to tell are going to lift nice. up and emerge as we want to support each other in telling them, right? So it's as much about the audience as the, the, the content maker, right? right? You have, so first of all, the audience has to be identified and know that it's there. Mm -hmm. So you get back to marketing distribution. Mm -hmm. So you need people, again, it's a systematic change that has to happen within the Hollywood conglomerate, is that you need to have the people at the top of the food chain who are part of this change, sure. right? Sure. Otherwise it will be another bottle, it'll just fizzle right. out again. And then you need, of course, the cultivation of the uh, diverse storytellers, which brings us to where am I right now? Right. <laughs> <NYU>. Right. <laughs> um, where we have 50% enrollment male-female, mm -hmm. which is very powerful. It's been that case for about three or four years now. Yeah. This is the undergraduate film and television program mm -hmm. at NYU Tisch School of the Arts, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of the preeminent film schools in the country, if not the world. And um, it's a large program because it's undergraduate. Right. And 50% uh, of our students are female. And that was a concentrated effort to make it 50-50, or did it just work out that way at this time? You know, it's a combination of all factors, mm -hmm. because again, a film school doesn't exist in a vacuum either. Right. So young women, young girls, I'm going to say, because in high school mm -hmm. you're still a girl. Right. So when you're in elementary school, middle school, high school, you have to start dreaming. Right. So you have to be in a cultural context that is telling you you can dream this way right. and helping you to shape this dream yes. and support the dream, then you, to, to think that this is something you can even do. Right. Then you have to have parents mm -hmm. and family mm -hmm. and community that is also supporting yes. so that you can get this idea and pursue it so yes. that you can even apply. Yes. Right. So it's part of it is just the applicant pool. Yes. So as culture has been shifting and we have women applying, then we can accept them. If they don't apply, we can't accept them. That's right? right. So it's a it, we're not existing back and we're part of a larger society. Right. We shape it, but we also reflect it. So it's very exciting to be here. Really exciting because I know that the extraordinarily brilliant, determined, uh, ethical, motivated young women that I am teaching and mentoring mm -hmm. are stepping into a world that is much more interested in receiving mm. than the world that I stepped into. And so I'm very optimistic for, for the work that they're going to be doing and right. going to be you know, facilitated to do. So. so what advice would you give to someone that would like to be sitting in your chair eventually someday? They want to enter into the business. They have stories to tell. They have stories they want to produce or direct. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give to someone that says... I want to do that. Where do I go? How do I start? What's the next step or two? Well, the the bar of entry is extremely low. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know anybody who doesn't have a cell phone. Mm -hmm. You can make a film. That's right. Just make it. And, you know, it's such a completely different world, speaking about the generation of the, you know, the 90s when David and I came up, where you had to shoot on celluloid that took resources and money and access to equipment that wasn't casual you know it was very deliberate to get access to the equipment and then once you made it you had very there were only a few venues but when you landed if you were of quality you would get noticed so that there was you know maybe one or two festivals but when you got there if your film was good somebody would notice you there are only a handful of distribution companies so what happened if your film didn't quite meet expectation or you didn't get distributed nothing you were dead in the water now with the advent of digital you can create stories you can edit them you can have all the means of production at home right. between your laptop your cell phone whatever or very inexpensive cameras you can create quality story and you can put it online Right. It's amazing. It's amazing. And yeah. there's thousands of film festivals to submit to so that you can get momentum and you can get notice and you should just go ahead and do it. I mean, of course, I recommend film school so that you're not just turning stuff out, but you're thinking about aesthetics, you're turning out good stuff, right? Right. Um, so I'd recommend film school. But if you don't have access to film school, there's a tremendous amount of information online. You know, the, all, the, all the little webisodes of the house, it's, it's everywhere. It's really not hard. Well, I yeah. loved our time here today. Thank you so much for sharing everything. Obviously, there's a lot more of you to share. So you can find everything you want to know about Janet Grillo online. <laughs> and stay tuned because we'll check back in with her at some point and see what she's up to next. Mm -hmm.